Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 26 of my beta campaign. Right now, I am in Kerbal Construction Time simulation mode, and on the pad I have a very simple craft, nothing special about it, except for this new part that comes from a mod called XT Landatron. And this is one of the Landatron parts that goes on much like a Separatron, and it is located in between the uh, landing legs that you see there. Um, and I want to show you how it works. So what we're going to do is we're just going to launch this thing up. And we're just going to go up a little way. There's, there's nothing really special about this craft at all. It's just got a pro body and, and junk on it. And then I cut the engine and I'm engaging the Landertron and notice that nothing happens. I lock on the retrograde vector to keep it oriented the right way. My hands are now away from the keyboard and those Landertrons fire on their own. And in fact, as you're probably seeing, it does a perfect suicide burn right down towards the pad. What these things are really great for is in working with remote tech and working on, on building, uh, landing on a distant world where you have, uh, where the uh, signal delay makes it virtually impossible to do it manually. So that's what these are for. And as you might be think, I might be realizing, I'm thinking about a lander specifically to go to. Drez. I got a Drez window coming up in 24 game days, and I want to build a lander to go to it. But the thing is, you're likely not to see that thing actually land for quite some time. So I thought I would show you this part a little bit ahead of time uh, so that you can get maybe a little bit of a preview. More likely, I'll probably give this thing a test run on Min Miss or something like that before then. Okay, let's see. What do we got coming up in this particular episode? I suppose the highlight is going to be the deployment of the Shenkwa, which is a probe that is going to be going into a Kelio-centric orbit. And Kelio, as in the kerbalization of the word Helio. Uh, and a Helio-centric orbit, or Kelio-centric orbit, is an orbit around the Sun uh, such that the probe remains stationary uh, relative to the surface of the Sun. And in order to do that, you need to get yourself into an orbit of about 1.5, an altitude of 1.5 million kilometers, which is, as far as the Sun's concerned, pretty close. It's about a tenth of the orb of the uh, of the uh, radius of Kerbin's orbit. Uh, but as you'll see, the deployment of this thing doesn't go without incident and does require a little bit of finagling a little but we'll get to that in a little bit uh otherwise what do we got also coming up what well, uh we got we're going to be finally getting that minmus probe around minmus so we'll get to see minmus we're also going to uh be revisiting the aldin altusi which if you recall was launched a long time ago on its way to moho but as you can see right here what we got is jeb in the aristarchus and this is one of these ones you fly around do crew reports and all that kind of stuff uh the only thing that was a little bit annoying was the there I had to go down and do a surface sample and a surface EVA over this rather awkward little peninsula that you can clearly not at least I couldn't land on it maybe other people could but I certainly wasn't going to give it a go but it wasn't too big a deal to sort of land nearby drive the thing over get what we needed and then get on back and that brings us to the Samyaji 2 and the Shenkwa. So the Shenkwa obviously is the payload of the Samyaji 2. And if you look carefully, you might notice something a little different about the, the Samyaji now in that it's a little bit longer. It actually had, I had to extend on the cargo bay just a little bit because uh, the vessel inside is just a smidge longer. Um, so one of the distinctions of this particular payload is that it's the first of my payloads to be using um, the ion drive. I've had that unlocked for a little while, but I finally now have cause to use it because in order to get into or get down to 1.5 million kilometers from the sun, that requires quite a lot of delta V, and that's what the ion drives are very, very good for. So, all the rockets that we've seen so far, they've all been actually chemical rockets, right? Using chemical combustion to provide thrust. What the ion drive does is it, it uses electricity to produce an electric field and then through that it propels ionized gas and this particular gas that it used in KSP is a xenon gas which is propelled out the backside and when you propel something out the backside that means you're going to get thrust out the front. So uh, that is the ze uh, xenon ion drive and uh, it actually is used in real spacecraft as well uh, most recently by the Dawn spacecraft which in the last couple of weeks of this recording had found itself into orbit around Ceres. Um, and what they provide is 
quite a lot of efficiency, so that means a lot of delta V for, for mass, but what they sacrifice is in thrust, very little thrust, as you will see. Um, as far as Shen Kuo, the, the person, or Shen Kuo, sorry, the person after whom this vessel is named, he was an 11th century, 11th century Chinese polymath. And again, polymath meaning that he did a lot of stuff with major contributions to mathematics, pharmacology, surveying, engineering, anatomy, geology, astronomy, and even more than that, I just got bored listing them all. Um, actually, what I want to just focus on is actually his development of the magnetic compass. Now, to be honest, the compass had existed before. People had noticed that in a variety of different reasons for quite some time, but what he did is he made it into a practical device. And he also discovered the distinction between true north and magnetic north, and finally allowed the compass to become a practical device that could be used for navigation. So we're just getting ourselves ready to deploy our payload, and then once it's deployed, we'll uh, get that burn going and get ourselves into the necessary solar orbit. And at that time, I'll talk a little bit about this vessel. So I gotta hunt down the decoupler. It's always a little bit tricky to find. There it is, and decouple. And whoa, uh-oh. Oh. oh, wow, that was quite a hit. That's, that's not, I hope everything's okay. Oh, and, oh dear. Uh, you can see there towards the right, those are bits of solar panel <laughs> drifting away. So the solar panels took a hit. That's not good. Um, uh, as I said, that the ion drive, it runs on electricity, and it really does need a fair amount of electricity to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to work. And so I didn't build this thing with a lot of extra solar. In fact, I didn't build it with any extra solar panels. So any loss of solar panels is going to affect uh, the ability of this thing to run anywhere near its full thrust. Now I'm tumbling because I had disabled the, uh, re the uh, reaction wheels. So now I'm enabling again. So I have some control of the vessel. Now I can get a good look at what happened here. So I got two solar panels down here at the bottom. I can see those, but I lost the two that are at the top. That means that I can probably only run the ion drive, at least in, in around Kerbin, at about 50% efficiency. And, and the thrust on it is low enough as it is, so it's going to be a long burn. And what I decided to do is, I mean, I, I could have done it with at, at 50% thrust and, and, and done it that way. But what I decided I was going to do instead was leave this thing up here in orbit and send up the Kayam 2 to do a little bit of repairs and get some, attach some new solar panels on this thing. So we'll get to that a little bit later in the video. And then at that time, we will launch this thing and we'll see how it goes. Well... At least the nice thing about a solar orbit is that there isn't a launch window that I need to worry about. I don't have to hit any specific launch window. The sun's always going to be there so uh, and in the right spot. So, uh, yeah, we'll just move on over to the descent of the Samyaji. And if you've been watching any of my last few videos, you're probably realizing that the, uh, the descent, landing the Samyaji always turns out to be a little bit of an adventure. And adding that extra mass because of the longer... Um, cargo bay and the extra fuel that was required as well because of having the longer cargo bay. Uh, yeah, that does affect it and it ends up going in hotter than it did before and that meant that I ended up losing, <laughs> uh, yeah, it started burning off my, um, my air brakes. So, yeah, there they go. Uh, Oh, well, what can you do? And I end up losing all of them, which does affect in the end. I thought maybe I didn't need them too much, but it does. It does yeah, this, the uh, attitude control does become a little bit trickier. But anyway, it, it all came out okay, and I did end up landing this thing fine anyway. And that brings us to MapSat 4, which has taken itself 18, almost 18 days to make its leisurely way over to Minmus. Took a bit of a roundabout route, uh, went out past its apoapsis and is getting Minmus on his way back to Kerbin. But nevertheless, it's now in uh, Minmus's sphere of influence. And yeah, 360 something days, finally got something in Minmus's sphere of influence. Um, the insertion here is, is pretty routine. 
but I wanted to take an opportunity to start to play a little bit more with the flight engineer because I know I'm going to be doing more and more maneuvers with longer and longer signal delays. I got a ship on its way to uh, Moho that you're actually going to see in this episode. I got one out to Duna. Soon I'll have one out to Dres. And I wanted to sort of wrap my head on how to use the uh, delay feature built into the flight computer. And um, what I really wanted to do was have a situation where I could set up a maneuver, get it to execute, that part's easy, but then I wanted it to uh, move itself to the node uh, just shortly before the maneuver comes along. And I wanted to put all that stuff in in advance. Um, so that, you know, I could orient it so that it's still getting electrical power and then just before it gets to the node, it moves itself over or just, yeah, just before it gets to the maneuver node, it moves itself to the correct attitude and then does the burn. Um, and, and, and I spent myself, I, I played around with this, the flight engineer for quite some time and, and I don't think I can get it to, I can get it to sort of do these, uh, delayed, you know, going prograde or retrograde or whatever. Um, to be honest, after doing this video, and act specifically actually after playing around with the Aldin Altusi, which is on its way to Moho, which you'll see in a little bit, I think I did get some stuff figured out. But anyway, I ended up doing the insertion and, and turning on the... All this thing has is mapping stuff. I didn't put any science on it because I don't need science. So it's just got that uh, spectral analyzer for mapping biomes. It's got the altimeter for mapping terrain, and it's got the... Uh, uh, carbonite detector on the top for detecting carbonite and that's about it. And that brings us to the Aldin Altusi which has been in flight now for 111 days on its way to Moho and in need of an orbital correction burn which is coming up in just a couple of minutes. But I want people to take note of the 23 second signal delay. So I put in a command uh, about 10 seconds ago to turn towards the maneuver node uh, and it is now counting that down and counting that down a few more seconds to go two more seconds one more second and there it goes now to going towards the maneuver node prograde so um, yeah you can see why now this flight computer is completely 100 percent necessary it's also getting planned to do the uh, maneuver in about a minute and actually, it was in playing around with it here that I actually finally figured out what I was looking for. Watch here as I deactivate this communitron, which is no longer necessary. There we go. All right, so it's going to take, again, 23 seconds before that command uh, gets executed. And again, what it's doing is modeling uh, the speed of light, a uh, curbalized speed of light, which is one-tenth our speed of light, but, you know, to make it sort of in scale with the rest of the game. And yeah, a few more seconds and then that communitron will deactivate. There it goes. But you know, it was in the playing around with this that I finally figured out how to do those delayed reactions. I was getting confused with Maps at 4 because every time I went to put in a command to go to the node, to adjust attitude towards the node, it said hold maneuver node prograde. And all I saw was the word prograde and I thought it was turning to prograde, but it's the maneuvers prograde. I should have figured it out. So. Uh, this will make more sense later the next time I come to uh, do one of these. But anyway, we're just a few seconds away from the burn. And there it goes. All right. And you can see my target actually is Eve still because I was I, I fiddled around again to try and see if I can get an encounter with Eve after it went by Moho, but there, there was no way to do it. So this thing is just going to do a flyby of Moho. Again, I can't get uh, a capture. I don't have enough Delta V. Um, but what I will do is set up the resulting orbit after Moho so that it ends up uh, in an orbit that will encounter Moho Again, so we'll do we'll do several passes of Moho over a fairly large period of time. And that brings us to Robble and Bill on their way to the Shenkwa to see if they can attach on some solar panels so that it can run at its maximum efficiency. And so this is just going to be an orbital rendezvous, but I'll, I'll fess up right now. I ended up botching this this uh, rendezvous just a little bit. Um, the Shekwa is in an 80 kilometer, about an 80 kilometer circular orbit, which is my standard low carbon parking orbit before <coughs> I move vessels on to other things. And 
So this thing's also on its way to an 80 kilometer orbit. And whenever you do rendezvous, you shouldn't go into the same orbit. You should go into a different orbit. But my KOS launch program is set to go to an 80 kilometer orbit every single time because that's what I do every single time. I, if, I, if I have things I want to rendezvous with, I usually end up moving them to other orbits. But uh, in this case, that didn't work. If I didn't, I got lazy. I shouldn't have used KOS. I should have done this manually and I probably could have uh, got launched straight into the encounter. But because I was using KOS and it was dumb and I just let it kind of run its way, well, I ended up quite a ways behind uh, the Shenkua. And remember our normal trick is if you're behind something but in the same orbit, then what you want to do is speed yourself up and you do that by burning retrograde to lower your orbit, but I couldn't lower my orbit enough without it dipping into the atmosphere. I'm only at 80 kilometers. Uh, so, yeah, I shouldn't have thought. I should have, you know what, if anything, I should have launched ahead of it so that I could raise my orbit and drift backwards towards it, but as it turned out, what I did is I put myself up to a 130 kilometer orbit to put myself into a different orbit, did several spins around Kerbin uh, to allow the Shenkua to catch back up to me, and then did my normal type of rendezvous. Though I almost messed up that too, and I got distracted by this little waypoint down there, and I was thinking about, oh, goo, what could that be, and all this stuff. Not really paying attention to the fact that, yeah, I'm kind of closing in on this thing pretty quickly, so <laughs> slam on the brakes there at the last moment, but uh, yeah, it came out all right. Well, I thought after that amateurishness that we've been seeing, it was time to at least make this last part look a little bit professional. So what I did is I took the Kayam and I, I spun it around upside down with the plan of coming immediately to the north, which I suppose from this perspective is up above um, the probe. And then I got in nice and close, as close as I dared, and opened up the cargo bay doors and settled myself directly right above the thing. Now, Inside the cargo bay, I had removed the docking port and replaced it instead with one of these KOS toolboxes. And of course, in the toolbox, there's going to be some solar panels, but what I also put in were some pipe endpoints. Now, I have no plan to, um, to uh, transfer any resources back and forth, but the idea here is to get Bill to attach an endpoint and connect the two vessels together so that it'll act as a tether, so the vessels now won't move around in relation to each other. And then it was time for Bill to uh, grab one of these solar panels and see if he can place it so that we can get this thing uh, working at its peak efficiency. Now, I did have a little bit of a aesthetic issue here in that I couldn't get the solar panels to be exactly opposite to the two that were already right there. They always were coming off on a little bit of an angle. And, and beyond the aesthetic thing, I was also worried that I wasn't be, going to be able to get 100% uh, solar exposure on all of the panels uh, at any one time. And so that's a bit of a concern because I do have the you know, four, pan four sets of panels for one ion drive is pretty tight as far as the electricity requirements go. Um, so I was a little bit concerned with that, but if that meant I had to run it at 90% or something, I, that was, that's what it would have to do. So I ended up deciding to go with this kind of rabbit ear look with one kind of angled one way and the other one kind of angled the other way. And then it was time for Bill to disconnect, get the uh, everything stowed back into the toolbox, and then we needed to descend the Kayam, with, which went without incident. And then it was time to get back out to the uh, Shenkwa and see if we could not get it into that heliocentric orbit that we were aiming for. So here we are planning our burn to get our periapsis down to the required 1.5 million kilometers from the sun. You can see the orbit there in green. Now you can get a bit of an appreciation just how close we are to the sun. In fact, this is not even low solar orbit, by the way. You have to get even closer to that. Um, but this burn ends up being a little over 3,500 meters per second, which is quite a lot, but no worries. This craft has delta V to spare. Even though uh, Kerbal Engineer is a little bit confused there on to the right, don't trust those numbers you see there. It's confused by the way that I set this craft up. And speaking of which, the way I did set this craft up is it's got the same idea as I did with my probes going to Duna and going to Moho in that I have 
first a transfer stage, who, the job of which is to get this thing up to escape velocity to get out of Kerbin's sphere of influence. And then once we've achieved that, it will detach and later on deorbit itself, so I don't have any debris left behind. And uh, then the rest of the burn will be carried out by the ion engines on the main probe. Uh, the one thing I did do a little bit different, other than the ion engines is that I made that transfer stage run purely on monoprop. So I'm going to have to make sure that I do leave a little bit of propellant left in the thing so that I do it does have enough uh, fuel for it to deorbit itself down the road. One of the things that's a bit tricky is trying to figure out how long this burn is going to take. Yeah, those RCS thrusters are going to have a thrust of about 2G. But most of the burn is going to be done by the ion engine, which will have a thrust of only about a tenth of that. So it's kind of hard to figure out just how long this is all going to take. So I finally, I, I, I get, maybe I could figure it all out, but I decided just to say, ah, oh, the heck with it. And just said, I'll just start three minutes before the burn. That sounds good. So uh, yeah, so we, we crank on, and this is running again just purely on the monoprop. And then just after we achieve escape velocity, which you can always tell when you get that camera change, we cut the engines, we, we uh, detach that lower stage, and then we fire up that ion thruster. And yes, that uh, plasma thruster, or not plasma, ion thruster is now on, accelerating at a whopping 2.16 meters per second squared. Yeah, I'm running into a little bit of a trouble, and I figured out after a bit that what happened is I lost my maneuver node. The maneuver node was somehow attached to the previous stage, so um, it's no longer hooked into the node. So eventually I get this locked back into the prograde vector and, and get this thing back on track. Um, yeah, I don't know about you, but I, I always never liked that that blue light. I, I think there should be something more in the animation than just that. There should be some sort of blue plasma, I think, that gets ejected out the back end just just to show us a little bit more that the thing is actually working. So I decided not to put the maneuver note back, just locked it into the prograde vector and just kept on burning, keeping an eye on my uh, periapsis. And seven minutes into firing up the ion engine, uh, almost all of it on uh, physics warp of course, I decided that I was getting a little bit worried about losing communication with just the communicon that I had open, so I decided I would open up the uh, the dish antenna that I had and pick an appropriate satellite to aim it at, so that if in the uh, if I end up losing communication, I can fire up that satellite uh, or point the dish that's on that satellite back to this thing and. Uh, wake it up again and it's a good thing I did that because 10 minutes later and again that's 10 game minutes at four times speed I did end up end up losing that communications uh, link so it turned out to be a simple matter just to go over to KeoComSat2 and point its antenna back at the Shenkua and uh, I even took the time to uh, pop over to the transfer stage and deorbit that because I was starting to get concerned that it might lose its communication link as well, though I did put a bigger communitron on that one because I knew I would be getting back to it uh, a little later than I was that I, that I, than with the main probe. So um, yeah, it was pretty simple. Just fire up again, keep on going. One thing to notice is uh, I've been keeping track of my electricity up there at the top right, and if you notice, it's been staying fully charged all the time despite the kind of quirky antennas that are there, or quirky solar panels that are there on the bottom. So, uh, well, I don't know, it kind of gives it personality. Anyway, after th almost 30 minutes since I first fired up this ion engine, our uh, periapsis gets down to the 1.5 million kilometers that we need it to be, and uh, when we get down there, we will circularize this orbit to finish off this contract, but that won't be for another hundred days so obviously that will be for an episode uh, in the future um, in the meantime I'm gonna shut down three of these four solar panels just because I got a feeling that once I get down there closer to the Sun heat's gonna be a little bit more of an issue and so I'll only have the one solar panel going just to keep that probe core alive but anyway that will finish off this particular episode and we hope to see you next time